Hey guys, Josh here. I am currently playing and reviewing all of the mainline home console Bokujo Monogatari games, currently known in the West as Story of Seasons and previously Harvest Moon. I already reviewed Harvest Moon for the Super Nintendo, and if you have not watched that video yet, I would recommend you do that, start from the beginning, as it will give you some additional context for today's video on Harvest Moon 64, as I will be talking about the history of the game, how it differs from its predecessor, the new gameplay mechanics, and a few interesting facts. First, let's talk about the history of Harvest Moon 64. In our last video, we learned how the development of the original game for the Super Nintendo was a bit chaotic. We were very lucky that the game even managed to get released, but in the end, things turned out well and the game was successful enough to get a sequel. Harvest Moon 64 was, for the most part, developed by the same group of people who were behind the first game, such as Yasuhiro Wada as the producer, Setsuko Miyakoshi on the planning and scenario, Tomomiya Matate as the main programmer, along with Tsuyoshi Tanaka as composer and Igusa Matsuyama as the character designer. The publisher Packin Video had merged with Victor Interactive in October 1996, shortly after the release of the first game and was renamed to Victor Interactive Software. With his team, Yasuhiro Wada formed Toybox, a division of Victor Interactive Software, that would take care of developing Harvest Moon 64 and later games in the series as well. Even though developing for new hardware was a challenge, the power of the Nintendo 64 and a more experienced team allowed Toybox to achieve the original vision they had for the series by including things that had to be cut from the first game. Victor Interactive Software published a game in Japan in February 1999 under the name Bokujo Monogatari 2, which means Ranch Story 2. And by the way, I should mention that this was technically the third game in the series since Harvest Moon GB for the Game Boy got released in between the two home console games, but we will keep the handheld entries for a separate video. So continuing, Natsume published a game in North America in December 1999 under the name Harvest Moon 64. Even though the Super Nintendo game did get a release in the PAL region, this was not the case for Harvest Moon 64 and players in Europe, Australia and other countries had to wait until 2017 when it came out for the Wii U's virtual console in order to play. And right now the Wii U eShop is in the process of closing down, so get the game now while you can. Now we'll talk a bit about my personal history with the game. I will do my best to be objective in this review, but you should know that Harvest Moon 64 was the first video game I ever owned. It is my favorite childhood game, one of my favorite games of all time, I played it so much, even though I couldn't read English at the time and I had no idea what the villagers were saying. I unfortunately lost my copy of the game a long time ago, I'm not too sure what happened and I'm still sad when I think about it. And now the game is super expensive to get, but yeah, so that's my history with Harvest Moon 64, let's keep going and now we're gonna talk about the game. The first thing I noticed coming from Harvest Moon on the Super Nintendo and going into Harvest Moon 64 was the impressive graphical jump. The game is in 2.5D so you can move in all directions, you can also rotate the camera to a few pre-selected angles but all of the sprites used are in 2D. Everything looks so much more detailed this time around, it's clean, colorful and honestly I would say it aged pretty well. You can't say the same for a lot of Nintendo 64 games, but here they went for a very simple and cartoony style, almost like clay, instead of trying to create a realistic 3D look. And I think it was a really smart decision because playing this in 2022, it is just as pleasing to the eye as it was in 1999, honestly it is a really cute game. The improved graphics also mean that the seasons look a lot more distinct and colorful than in the first game, making it more immersive. The color of the grass and trees will change of course, but now you will also see wild animals like snakes and monkeys, foxes, squirrels and so many more. They serve no real purpose in terms of gameplay, but they add to the atmosphere and change with the seasons. Also adding to the atmosphere is the music, every track in this game is so catchy, you can hear them in the background of this video, but here's a little bit of my favorite one, which is the fall theme. Overall, I really enjoyed the sound design of Harvest Moon 64. Not only is the music great, the sound effects, like using your tools and your footsteps, are so satisfying. Also in the summer you can hear cicadas and at night the music will stop to give place to the sounds of nature, like frogs, crickets, owls, and all of these will also change depending on the season. This is a level of attention to detail I have not noticed in recent farming games and it doesn't seem like much but it really makes you feel like you're in the countryside. This game just looks and sounds great, especially if we consider that it's all from 1999. Not only did the game improve from its predecessor on a technical level, but also in terms of gameplay. A lot of content that was cut from the first game was implemented into this one, making it an experience that is a lot more fleshed out. First, there are a few more crops you can plant, so in spring we now have cabbage, it takes a bit longer to grow than turnips or potatoes, but it sells for a higher price, rewarding players who have a bit more patience. 
We can also now grow flowers in both spring and summer such as the pink cat and the moondrop, which went to become staple flowers in the series. You can't sell them in this game, you will learn that pretty quickly if you try to put one in your shipping bin, but they make a great gift, especially for some of the girls. Every time you buy flower seeds, you will get some points for the flower shop raffle that takes place at the end of each year, and that raffle will give you the chance to win unique prizes such as an extra cushion for your band or some bat crystals, among a few other prizes. And right there, that's what I like the most about this game. There are tons of items to collect, whether it's through raffles, festivals, or some other events that the game has to offer, and that's what brings me back to this game over and over again. I feel like every playthrough I discover new little secrets and things that I missed from a previous playthrough and I'm definitely going to be talking a bit more about that later but let's go back to our crops for now. So we have cabbage, flowers, also in fall you're no longer limited to only grass, you can now grow eggplants as well. That's maybe just one vegetable but it's a lot more than zero and it makes fall just as busy as spring and summer, you will still make good money, and with all the mushrooms, it is a great season for foraging. So let's talk about that foraging. It was a real pain in the previous game because you didn't have a backpack, so you had to carry in your hands every single thing you picked up all the way from the mountain to your shipping bin one by one. Harvest Moon 64 changed everything with the addition of the rucksack, allowing you to carry 8 items as well as 8 tools. It's not a perfect system yet, for example you do have to press start every single time you want to take something out, which is a bit inconvenient but it makes everything so much easier compared to the first game and it gives more freedom to the player. So you can now go fishing, foraging and do all of these activities while keeping a few gifts in your bag for when you'll go to town later to see the villagers. There's also a toolbox, a cabinet, a fridge and all of these will let you put things away and we all take this for granted in 2022 but storage and inventory systems were still pretty new at the time and this would establish what we now considered standards in farming game. Only having 8 slots in your bag might seem too little but keep in mind there are no crafting mechanics or anything like that in this game so the only time it is a problem is when you're harvesting your crops because they don't stack in your bag. But most of the time the size of the backpack is not really a problem and you can also use your horse as a shipping bin, just like in the first game, which can save you a lot of time when harvesting. In winter, there isn't much foraging, but it's still a lot more exciting than in the previous game, as strawberries make their first appearance along with the greenhouse. So you won't be able to grow anything outside as your field of course will be covered with snow, but after buying the greenhouse, the flower shop will start selling strawberry seeds, so you will be able to plant that as well as any other crops, no matter the season, inside your greenhouse. And you know what, I really like how they did that. In the first game you couldn't plant anything at all in winter, which made the season quite boring frankly because there wasn't much to do at all. And on the opposite side of that, recent games in the series let you plant crops in winter exactly the same as in any other season, which makes the winter, well, not feel like winter that much. One of the things I consider so important in farming games is that every season feels distinct, with its own quirks, gameplay mechanics and things to do. However, so many games fail to deliver on that aspect and the whole year feels very samey. So that's one thing I really like about Harvest Moon 64. The greenhouse is 30,000 G, so it is quite expensive, especially if you're trying to get it before the first winter. And also you run the risk of losing it every single time there's a hurricane, because yes, that game was just brutal like that. If you're not lucky, you could build a greenhouse and lose it the next day. And by the way, I quickly have to say that this game, to this day, is subject to so many rumors, one of them being that if you put your dog in the greenhouse, it won't get destroyed, but that's not true, it can still get destroyed and your dog will just spawn back outside your house. That being said, even though this rumor turned out to be false, there are quite a few bugs and things you can exploit in this game, which would require a whole separate video because I have so much to say about this game as it is without getting into the bugs. Anyway, I think that's one of the games that handle winter the best in the series, because it rewards players that work really hard to build a greenhouse, but even if you don't have the greenhouse, there is still some stuff to do. There is a mine that's open from the 8th to the 30th day of winter between 6am and 5pm, so you can go there and dig with your hoe to find some gems and minerals, or holes that will get you deeper into the mine. Once again, I like that the mine is just for winter, as it really makes the season feel different from the others. In later games in the series, ores will be used to upgrade tools, but it works a bit differently in Harvest Moon 64. Your tools will upgrade automatically simply by using them a lot, and each tool has a basic silver and gold version, each being more efficient than the previous one. The tools are actually very easy to upgrade because since time doesn't pass while you're inside buildings, and because your tools get experience no matter how you use them, you can just stay in your house or you could also sneak in the cellar if you want some free wine to replenish your stamina, then you can just use your tools a few dozens or hundred times, 
and if you have some patience it can upgrade in a day. If you do the wine trick this will also allow you to increase your alcohol tolerance which in turn will allow you to out drink everybody on New Year's Day. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves now let's go back to our mining. What are the things you find in the mines for if they're not for upgrading your tools? Well, they can be sold for money or given to certain characters as gifts, some of them triggering certain events or giving you access to unique items. For example, in the souvenir shop, there's a brown vase that's not for sale. However, if you give the shop owner a blue rock, he will paint the vase in blue and you will then be able to purchase it to decorate your house with. That's such a small thing, but when that happens for the first time, it feels great because the game is rewarding you for interacting with the villagers and giving them things. It also doesn't explicitly tell you to do these things, so unless you look at a guide, you will discover these secrets as you play and interact with the characters. Some villagers will give you access to special items like this blue vase, others will give you recipes. There's no cooking in this game, but after building the kitchen, you will have a recipe book to fill up with 35 different recipes that you will get by giving ingredients to specific villagers. It's a bit of a shame that you can't actually cook, especially since you can have this beautiful kitchen added to your house, but it's still fun to complete the recipe list just for the sake of it but also to get a good ending, which we'll get to a bit later. For now, let's talk about the relationships and characters in Harvest Moon 64, which were a huge improvement from the first game, and the reason why so many people, including myself, think so highly of it. Flower Bud Village is filled with charming characters, and this time, most characters have a name, first of all, as well as a portrait that changes with their mood. Characters will repeat themselves a lot, but there's still a lot more dialogue than in the first game, and when you increase your relationship with a character, whether it's one of the marriageable girls or just any villager, they will open up and start telling you different things. This makes you feel like you're slowly being integrated into the village life, and it makes the characters feel real, even if they're actually pretty simple. For example, characters like Grey or Karen's father will be very cold at first, but they will eventually open up a little bit if you give them gifts and talk to them every day, and you will start learning more about them. Not everybody will be your friend from day one, like it is the case in many modern farming games. Other characters, such as Harris the mailman, will first say very generic things about mail delivery. I thought he was going to be a lifeless or boring character, but eventually he starts talking about his feelings, how he has a crush on a girl in town but he's not sure how to tell her. Then, one day you will see a cutscene where he receives a love letter from Maria. They're both very shy characters, so it's a really cute cutscene and eventually, if you talk to him regularly, he will find the courage to propose to her. This game introduced rival marriages, and when you befriend the different guys, they will talk to you about their love life, you will see them evolve as characters, all the way until they get married and have a child with one of the bachelorettes. Unfortunately for Harris, in this playthrough, I married Maria before he did, I always went for a potpourri when I was a kid, but I wanted to go a different route this time. I really like this rival system, it makes you feel like the characters have a life of their own. It's fun to see the different events unfold in the village and how you can have an influence on them. Unfortunately, just like in real life, not every marriage has a happy ending. If Cliff marries Anne, they will constantly tell you how they're always fighting, and you can tell their relationship isn't very healthy. There's even a portrait of Cliff with bruises for when he tells you he had a fight with his wife the night before, and this is the only line in the game where that portrait is used. So while at first glance Harvest Moon 64 is really cute and colorful, it's also not afraid to tackle more serious topics and portray a side of the country life that's not just harvest festivals and bubbly cows. Besides Cliff and Anne constantly fighting, there's also Karen who doesn't have a great relationship with her father, and he constantly talks negatively about her. Some characters can be seen at the bar almost every night, everybody gets drunk during New Year, and this time the censorship is not as strong as in the first game, so we're no longer drinking juice but real beer, wine and liquor. The topic of death is also quite present in this game, from May the little girl often talking about her mom who passed away, to Ellen actually passing away during the second year, the little funerals when one of your animals dies, and of course the scolding that comes with it to tell you how important it is to take care of your animals. It is still an E-rated game, so it doesn't dive into too many details, and a lot of it is implied and might not be noticed by younger players, but it is definitely a bit dark at times, or at least a bit less sanitized than modern entries in the series. I think it's part of what makes the charm of this game and what makes the characters feel alive. Life has ups and downs, happy times and sad times, and Harvest Moon 64 manages to capture that in a simple yet effective way. So going back to the happy stuff you can get married in this game, 
If things go wrong, your wife can also leave, which involves dramatic little cutscenes, but let's concentrate on the good part. As you strengthen your relationship with your future wife, you will get to see some events to learn more about her, and gradually her heart will change colors, going from white to blue, green, yellow, and then pink. And at that point, you will be able to give her a blue feather and get married. Your farm life will become a bit easier after marriage, as your wife will sometimes help with the work, each girl has a different behavior, but most will pick up eggs or feed the chickens from time to time, and Popery can even water some crops. There are also other little joys that come with married life, such as your wife making a meal when it's her birthday, as well as on your wedding anniversary, and if you attend these meals, it will positively affect your relationship. If things go well, you will eventually have a child who will grow to become a toddler. If you neglect your relationship, on the other hand, as I said previously, that can lead to your wife leaving, so you should talk to her every day, go to bed around the same time as her, so don't stay out too late, and make sure to give her gifts regularly. I like that there's this aspect of having to maintain their relationship, even if it's not very difficult, and I love to see the little events that occur after marriage and your child being born and slowly growing up. Once again, even though there's not a ton of diversity in the dialogue, I feel like I cared about my marriage in this game more than I did in other games in the series. Everything is very simple but well executed. Alright, so we talked about a bunch of different things, but let's not forget a crucial part of this game, the animals. The chickens and cows are still there, working pretty much the same way as in the previous game, giving you egg and milk respectively. But we also have sheep now who are a bit less expensive than cows but more expensive than chickens and they will be giving you wool every few days. Cows and sheep will give you more valuable products the more you care for them which makes it important to make sure you don't let them get sick. Animals will get sick if they're not fed, if they're left outside on a rainy day and then you will need to buy medicine to heal them. Bringing animals outside isn't that useful in this game not only because they risk getting sick if it rains or dying if there's a storm. I had all of my chickens die at once because I've forgot to check the weather forecast the night before and I just left them outside. But another reason why you might want to keep them inside is because time passes while you're outside but not inside. So if you want to take advantage of that, might as well just leave them inside. And also, it can be a bit of a pain to push your animals in and out even with the bell. You also have a dog and a horse in this game, which brings me to the festivals. For me, festivals are one of my favorite things about farming games and are quite fun in Harvest Moon 64. During the dog and horse competitions, there are three races during the day and you will be able to bet on the winners, which will give you medals to buy a wide variety of prizes like a toy horse or cow team clock. You can also participate in those races and to win, you will have to make sure you have a good relationship with your animals, which can be achieved by feeding and picking up your dog every day and riding and brushing your horse. Other festivals include the egg hunt, where you run around town trying to find the eggs of the correct color, very similar to the same event that was in the first game. There's also a swimming contest where you have to mash the A button as fast as you can, and other festivals where you can dance with the bachelorette of your choice, and it's always fun to just talk with all the villagers on festival days and see what they have to say. Especially on New Year's Day, where your goal is to outdrink everybody one by one, and your success is determined by the amount of drinks you had since you started playing. The game actually had a hidden alcohol resistance stat, which only serves for this festival and you don't really win anything, but it just shows how developers had fun with this game by adding that kind of detail. Just like in the first game, there are multiple endings in Harvest Moon 64. On the first day of the third summer, your dad will come to visit your farm and will go around town asking everybody how you've been doing. Each character will judge you based on specific criteria, for example, Doug will mention how well or bad you took care of your animals, the fisherman will praise you if you caught a lot of fish, Gourmet will tell your dad if you collected a lot of recipes or not, and so on. I really like this because it allows the player to see how well they did and encourages them to try to do better and enjoy different aspects of the game on their next playthrough. If you did really well and had lots of friends, you would even get a party photo to add to your album. And I can't believe I haven't spoken about the photo album yet. As you play, you will encounter tons of different events. For example, Popery might ask you to go in the mountain every day to water a flower, or the carpenters might ask you to help them to work on a new bridge. Not only are these events really fun and spice up the day-to-day -day of farming chores, if you do them properly, you will get a photo added to your album as a memory. It doesn't have much purpose for the game, but if you are a completionist, you will want to try to fill up the album, and knowing that many events can be missed, it is quite the challenge. If you want to do everything right and get all of the pictures in time, you will have to plan your schedule accordingly. Also, if you don't know, time flies in this game. As far as I know, it is the game in the series where time passes the fastest, and you really do have to plan what you will do in your day, as you will lose precious time if you just wander around. By the way, you do need to press start every single time you want to see what time it is, 
which can feel a bit annoying. It's so fast though, I feel like it would have been stressful to just have the clock move in front of your eyes. So actually it might be a bit better that we have to press start. But I like how you have to plan and prioritize certain things in your day. Maybe one day you'll take care of your crops and animals, then you'll collect some mushrooms and go to the store. The next day maybe you'll do your farm chores, then you'll go fishing, then give something to one of the girls. But you can't do all of these things, you can't do everything in just one day. And I like the importance of planning. In many modern farming games you have so much time and in my case I often end up going to bed super early because I don't necessarily want to do everything every day. And I know there are really two kinds of people here so let me know if you prefer fast days or slow days in your farming games. But just know that Harvest Moon 64 might stress you out if you really want to take things slow or if you don't like the possibility of maybe missing out on some events or pictures if you don't do certain things at certain times. If you like time management and a faster pace however you will really enjoy it and trying to do a perfect run will be such a fun challenge for you. One little side note, the Japanese version of the game has a menu screen where you could see all of the stats of your farm and those would be very useful but unfortunately due to technical restrictions with the text, this menu was completely left out from the English version of the game. Both in the Japanese and English versions there are also quite a few things that the game doesn't tell you directly which players only discovered in the last few years data mining the game. For example, there's both a stamina and a fatigue system. So stamina is pretty easy to tell when it gets low because your character will look exhausted, but fatigue on the other hand is not as obvious. It is a hidden stat with a scale going from 0 to 100, and once you reach 100, you will get sick and lose an entire day in bed. If you use your tools after 6 p.m. or when it rains, your fatigue will go up, and to make it go down, you will have to go to sleep, use the toilet or your bath. You remember the bat crystals I talked about at the beginning of this video? Those will actually make your bat more effective at reducing fatigue and that's important because fatigue will carry from one day to the next. So if you play and you find yourself sick pretty often, that might be something worth looking into. These are all things the game doesn't tell you about at all, which is a shame because I think it's a great mechanic. I just wish it was somewhat visible, it would be so much better. I can't believe that for my whole childhood I played this game without even knowing this fatigue stat existed. Harvest Moon 64 has a lot of secrets and I think it helps make its charm, but I hope some of these things would be clarified if there ever was a remake of this game. To conclude, Harvest Moon 64 managed to fix most flaws from its predecessor and add the ideas that were originally cut from it. I think it is the perfect example of a good sequel, there's a lot more content, more depth and obviously it also looks much better due to the jump from the Super Nintendo to the Nintendo 64. The game also established many staples of farming games like storage, a proper inventory system, mining, as well as buildings like the greenhouse and so much more. If you're in search of a fast-paced farming game that is simple and easy to pick up but that can also be challenging and you like how the game looks and its charming characters and you can easily get over some outdated mechanics like how you have to press start every time you want to grab something from your inventory, I think you should give Harvest Moon 64 a try. If on the other hand you're looking for a slower paced experience or if you feel like you might get annoyed by the lack of features like cooking or other things that are typically found in more modern games, you might want to pass this one. That being said though, for a lot of people, this is their favorite game in the series and there's a reason for it. So if you like the series and have not played Harvest Moon 64 yet, I recommend you try it just so you can say that you tried it and you will get to experience where a lot of the most popular characters in the series originated as well as many of the series core features. For me this is the game that made me fall in love with the farming sim genre and without it who knows maybe this channel wouldn't exist. I like to go back to it once in a while I always find myself having so much fun with this game but of course nostalgia might have something to do with that. If you remember liking Harvest Moon 64 but have not played it in a while you should just go and play it again if you can. So what do you all think about Harvest Moon 64? Have you played it. What is your favorite thing about this game? What is your least favorite thing? Please let me know all of that in the comments and next time I will be reviewing Harvest Moon Back to Nature for the PlayStation 1. So make sure you are subscribed if you don't want to miss that and leave a like for more Story of Seasons content like this and I'll see you all in the next video.